can ask me questions uh, until I give the presentation, and then Yabi will just say when I can give the when I start giving the pre presentation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Bayesian bandits. Um, well, as you uh, it, uh, basically uh, is a solution to a very nice solution to a set of problems, and I'll describe some of these problems in, in detail. Um, but in particular, the word Bayesian here refers to how we're going to be um, including information about probabilities and updating probabilities. And probably some of you have um, have already seen some some that there's basically two ways, if you will, of of trying to estimate and deal with probabilities in statistics. There's the Bayesian approach, and there's the um, a frequentist approach. Um, now, uh, there are some uh, very nice blogs, which I can actually post after this, um, uh, after this talk, um, describing why the Bayesian approach is actually the, the, the best approach to take. And the frequentist approach doesn't actually um, allow you to ask and answer the types of questions that you really care about. Um, Bayesian approach is very nice because you're very, you're very clear from the outset um, what your assumptions are before you go into the um, before you start attacking the problem, um, what your prior information is, and how and how you use that prior information, um, and indeed how you update this prior information you have about the problem with new information that you're collecting from some experiment, and how that finally influences then your your knowledge of the of, of the, um, the, the problem you're trying to solve now that's quite different from the frequentist approach where actually many assumptions are hidden from the user um, and indeed you don't know um, you know the prior information it's not so easy to bring prior information into the problem um, and you, of, of when you're trying to deal with um, probabilities um, and it's not so and it's and it's not like you don't you don't really show what your prior information is in in such a clean way that you do when you when you're dealing with Bayesian statistics and um, Bayesian probability theory. Um, so, um, I mean, for that reason alone, that the Bayesian choice is a very good choice because um, uh, you're very honest and clear about your starting assumptions um, and and your uh, and 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 you update this the, this uh, this knowledge as you go. Are we ready to start, Yabi? I, um, I was muted. Yes, go on. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. So I'll start with the talk. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. My name's Ben. I'm a, um, uh, a senior a scientist and data scientist at Carl Zeiss. I've been with Carl Zeiss now for about a year and a half, for almost two years. Um, before this, I was an academic research scientist. I was an astrophysicist a lot and a cosmologist a lot like Yabi in his previous life. Um, well, by previous life, I mean in his, uh, you know, in, in, uh, um, up until a few years ago, um, I was a, uh, a postdoc and research scientist, um, and I was uh, working in the area of cosmology and astrophysics and also machine learning data analysis. So let me tell you a bit about my current employer, Carl Zeiss. Um, so we are a big company, and we've got offices around the globe. Um, the headquarters are based in Germany, and this is actually where I am now. I'm in Munich. Um, and there's a couple of other locations in Germany where we have headquarters, um, Jena and Oberkocken. Um, we have about 10,000 employees in Germany, and there's about 50,000 employees around the globe. So we're a relatively large company. Um, and maybe one of, the, one of the things that I really think is great about Carl Zeiss is that every day we we enable about 10,000 people to get their vision back. So um, Carl Zeiss is in, has got many different departments, and one of them deals with um, vision and, and um, uh, devices for opticians. And the types of devices we make enable opticians to restore the sight of about 10,000 people um, per day through cataract surgery and, and things like this. And so this already is, is a, a really um, nice uh, idea that I mean, shows that we're a good company. Um, the company's in, in owned by employees, not by stakeholder, um, by shareholders, which means the employees really drive the direction of the company. Um, and we are, and because of this, 
we have a very strong research culture and we have funding which actually comes from the company to fund r d um and this is really from the, the, the from the start of the company which was a marriage of um a people very uh, a guy very strong with very strong research and scientific experience this was ernst, um, ernst abbey and and a very strong um technician who could implement these ideas and this is carl zeiss and this is where the the company comes from um, there's also a management structure for scientists, um, which is different from the standard management structure where, have, where basically you have people um, uh, filling out PowerPoint presentations all day long. Um, the management structure, structure for scientists actually allows you to just keep doing science. So what type of data science do we do at Carl Zeiss? Um, we do predictive maintenance. So we want to know when a production line machine will fail. So imagine we have a, a data stream coming in. We analyze this data stream and try to understand when some component of the machine or when some component in the production line might fail so that we can already ship the, um, the components to the factory. Um, and this allows, and we can do this predictive maintenance. So we do maintenance before something breaks. And this allows us to keep running um, uh, uh, for longer periods of time. One project I was also involved in is predicting the memory usage of our computing clusters. So imagine that we um, we want to predict what the future memory usage is, uh, and let's say we want to predict 10 minutes into the future, and then this will allow us to either upscale or descale the computing cluster, which can save us money. Um, and so this is a, a plot of the predicted memory usage about the against the actual memory usage in gigabytes. 10 minutes in the future, and you see that the we, we end up with very nice results here. Um, we also do deep learning-based um, um, uh, image analysis. So here's an example of some image segmentation that we do um, uh, of, of the face. We segment that into different parts. Um, but we also do fault detection of lenses, uh, and there's lots of other um, deep machine learning-based analysis going on. And finally, um, we also um, deal with recommender systems, um, and this is one of the, my main tasks, is to build a glasses recommender system. So a consumer or a person goes into an optician shop, and my algorithms analyze their face and says what glasses would be a good match to their face shape. And actually, I use Bayesian bandits as the solution to this problem, and Bayesian bandits are exactly what we're going to talk about um, today. So. Um, I hope that I, uh, the, so the overview of the talk is I want to recap about probabilities in everyday life and um, look in particular at these Bernoulli processes and the types of classes, class of problems that we can solve with the Bernoulli process. I think I have a, a spelling mistake here. Um, and then talk about uh, Bay Bayesian bandits. And then I expect this to last about 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll actually spend 20 minutes um, working in the Jupyter Notebook that I prepared, um, implementing the a Bayesian bandit algorithm and playing a bit around with um, these beta functions, which are the, um, a key component of these Bayesian bandits. And then, um, then once, let's say, we, we have a nice solution, then we actually want to package this solution up and, and have it running somewhere that's useful for other people to interact with. And so you can imagine that in your day-to-day -day data science lives, you might train a machine learning algorithm, um, but you actually need to take that algorithm and put it somewhere such that other people can interact with it and they can make predictions. And so we're going to use Docker uh, to do this, and, and i explain what Docker is later on. Um, and we will build a, um, an API service within Docker um, to interact with our Bayesian bandits. And so this is what we'll, we'll work through together. So let's recap um, some probability. Um, I actually think that uh, we use probability in our lives a lot more often than people think we do. Um, imagine that you want to ask someone to marry them, right? And what you actually do is, in your mind, you try and estimate what's the probability that the person will say yes, that they will marry you, given that you know some information about, um, given that you ask them the question, and you know some information about your relationship. So before you ask them, will you marry me, you are actually trying to estimate the probability of, of acceptance, the probability that they will say yes. Um, likewise, if you know you have this standard uh, example of is, is, a, is a 
is a coin, a fair coin. So the probability of getting a heads if you flip it a few times. And you can estimate that the, that the, the coin is fair with some information that you get about the coin by flipping it many times and seeing if it's a head or, or tail. You're also right now um, engaged in um, trying to estimate the probability that you will get a better job if you do this data science camp that, that we're on and some other information. And you want to compare this with the probability of getting a better job or a job as a data scientist if you don't do the data science camp that you're on and some other information. So I, I hope you see that we're really in our daily lives, we very often estimate probabilities, even if we don't explicitly think that we're estimating the prob um, probabilities. Now, um, rather than just estimating one number for a probability, um, it's actually better to describe our uncertainty or our knowledge in the form of a probability distribution function. So um, we want to know if a, a, for example, let's pretend we want to know if a, a, if a coin is fair. Um, so what's the probability that we'll get some heads uh, ahead based on some information we have about the coin? Now, what we should we should set the problem up by saying, what prior information do we need to answer this question? So, um, do we need to know um, the results of many flips of of, a co of the coin before we can um, estimate if this is a fair coin or not? Or maybe we get other information from our knowledge of coins in general. So, um, has anyone ever seen a coin that is biased, such that when you flip it, you always get ahead? Um, if so, please answer in the in the in the chat window. Um, personally, I've never seen an unbiased co uh, an, an, uh, a biased coin. I've only ever seen unbiased coins. So my prior information, if someone shows me a coin and says, "Is this is this a um a biased coin or not?" My prior information will say probably it's not a biased coin because I've never seen a biased coin in my life. Um, Another uh, way that we'd like to estimate probabilities is um, uh, let's say that we have uh, we want to build a recommendation engine. We have a set of n possible items that we could recommend to some to some user, um, and we want to maximize some purchase. So the probability that we want to estimate is what is the purchase rate for this particular item i, given that we have many items, um, compared to the purchase rate. Um, probability of some different item. And what we want to do, of course, is show the item which has got the largest probability of being purchased um, to the user um, when we make a recommendation. And now another example of when we want to estimate probabilities, and this is actually a problem that we will work on today, is trying to figure out which of n possible creatives, uh, and by mean creatives, I mean um, how a web page looks, and where the buttons are, what images you have, um, which of these, um, which of these possible creatives should you show to a website user to maximize the click-through rate? So that brings you from one page to the next page. Um, and let's say you have a, um, a, a it, um, uh, so you have a set of pages you could show the user potentially, and you want to show the one which maximizes the throughput, the click-through rate. Um, and basically, you want to estimate the probabilities um, for each of the different creatives and then choose the creative, which is most likely to make the user go to the next stage in the, in the, in the, in the journey. So um, Bayes' theorem provides a very nice framework for estimating probabilities. Um, I highly recommend you check out Wikipedia here on Bayes' theorem. Um, it's, a, it's a very complete um, resource. Uh, and and basically, what, what we have, if, if we turn this into the language of this click-through rate problem, is we want to estimate um, this P A given B, um, which is the probability of a, of, um, a click-through rate for some game, given that we, um, uh, we want to estimate this based on some prior knowledge we have about the click-through rate for a particular game, and some new ob observed behavior that we have. So maybe we showed this creative to it to some consumers, and some of them went th clicked through, and some of them didn't. And then we want to use that to update our, um, our, our, our knowledge of the probability of the click-through rate 
for this particular creative. Um, so uh, PA here is our prior knowledge. This is what we, the knowledge we have about the system before we start. And it might be that we have no knowledge, but we can still encode that nicely using Bayes' theorem. Um, and then um, PA given B, uh, B given A is um, our new knowledge that we're adding to the system. And this allows us to update our knowledge of the probability of the click-through rate PA given B um, based, based on this formula. Um, this probability of the B um, is, is, is uh, some technical um, detail which we can just consider as a normalization constant. Now, I think you've already looked at how to estimate probability distribution functions, and indeed how to sample from probability distribution functions. And what you find is that there's, this can quickly become a computational mess. You'd have to do MCMC. Um, you maybe need to draw millions of times or thousands of times from the distribution, and and it can become very a very difficult task and very computationally expensive. However, um, if we um, just look at a particular some, some classes of, of of problems, and so I want to look at problems coming from this Bernoulli distribution, um, and if we're able to. And, and if we're able to um, reform the question we want to ask into a into this type of um, uh, in, into the type of question that can be answered by a Bonoli distribution, um, and we're happy to make some simple assumptions or some quite quite good assumptions about the, what we expect the shapes of the PDFs to look like, then we can actually in, analytically and instantaneously calculate our probability distribution functions and update our probability distribution functions when we get new knowledge. So we don't have to go through this, this sampling step. So um, just to recap, the Bernoulli uh, distribution is a, basically, is, is, this is a quote directly from Wikipedia, um, the probability distribution of a random variable, um, which we can think of as our click-through rate, for example, which takes the value one, a user would click through with some probability p, and the value zero, a user would not click through with some probability one minus p. Um, and less formally, we can think of um, the classes of problems which fall under the category of Bernoulli distributions as um, uh, if we can model the set of possible outcomes of a single experiment in terms of yes, no questions. So imagine we have, uh, here I show some, um, some examples of, of, of the types of data that we can use, we can model with a Bernoulli distribution. So imagine we have a data stream of true and falses, then we can model that by a Bernoulli distribution, um, heads and tails from maybe a coin toss. And likewise, will a user click through if they see a particular web page creative, yes or no, compared to will a, will a user click through if they see a second set of web page creatives, um, yes or no. Now, um, assuming that we can rephrase the question in terms of this Bernoulli distribution, then we come to a couple of technical points, and that is one, that the, um, the Bernoulli distribution is well described by the, um, by the, beta, uh, by the bon binomial distribution, and that's this another ex extract from Wikipedia. And there's a thing called the conjugate prior of the, um, uh, um, of the binomial distribution, and, and the conjugate prior of this is the beta distribution. Um, we'll actually come back to this term later on, and I, and I actually want you as, as homework to go and read up about this. Um, but for now, just keep in mind that we have a beta distribution, and we have, a, um, and we have the binomial distribution. And if we assume that the, um, if, if we're happy to assume that the, find, that the shapes of the PDFs um, uh, take a particular form, um, then actually we can rephrase this this question uh, and we can estimate the probabilities um, uh, and, in, and update our knowledge very easily. So what this means is that the our prior information, PA, is a drawn from a beta distribution. We update that information with our binomial distribution uh, and then that actually leads us to the, um, the posterior distribution function, this p of a given b, um, is, then, is then also a beta distribution. 
and in, a, in the notebook, we'll actually show this exactly. Um, these are some complex topics, um, so I really suggest reading about them at home um, afterwards. Um, now, the bottom line of what this is, what does this allow us to do, is imagine that we um, we want to update uh, some knowledge of our probability distribution function. So this could be the probability of a click through for a particular game, given some new information. And we can calculate this from our knowledge of the prior. And let's say um, we've already shown this to um, this creative to some users, and we have NS previous successes, so NS previous click throughs from NT previous times we showed this creative to different users. Then uh, uh, the form of our probability distribution function for our prior looks like this, beta of 1 plus ns, 1 plus nt minus ns. And we trivially can then update. So our p a given b can be updated simply by calculating. Um, so let, let's say we've, we've, we've got some new knowledge. So we've shown the creative to some new users. Um, and we can now then up, we have a new number of successes, so the new number of times the, the users click through the web page, and a new number of trials is the new number of times we showed that creative to, to users. Then our, our posterior distribution, this P of, P of the click through rate, given, the, given this all this new information and all of our prior information, is then simply, um, again, a beta function, one plus all of our successes from the new successes and the previous successes and one plus all of the trials, and I've actually um, forgotten a what one minus all of the successes. So um, let, me, um, uh, let me just fix that. Minus all of this. Um, so the, you see the beta function is actually um, taken the, uh, it's a very trivial update to the probability distribution function, given that we have new knowledge. We're just doing some addition. Okay, so when might this type of analysis be useful? Um, so there's a very famous problem called the multi-arm bandit problem, and this is this is this is the problem. You are now in Las Vegas in America, and you stood in front of five different slot machines, um, and these slot machines are also known as one-arm bandit machines because they have a, a, a one arm. It's like a lever that you pull to make the, 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 um, the wheels go around. Um, now, each machine has a different probability of paying out, but you don't know what that probability is. So what strategy should you take to maximize uh, your reward? So what's the probability of the, the payout given that you've, just, that you've got information about your, the machine? Um, you can also, uh, uh, so you can use the multi-arm bandit um, solution for this type of problem. Likewise, you can use it for a recommendation problem, as I state here. And the problem we're going to look at is by saying, OK, you're a website owner. Um, you've got five different creatives to show your visitors. And you want to maximize the click-through rate to get a visitor to the next stage or to the, to the payment page. You don't know which creative provides the best click-through rate right now. Um, and importantly, getting a visitor on your site is expensive. Therefore, you want to minimize the showing of a bad creative. So one of these five creatives might be worse than the others. You don't want to show that. So what strategy, strategy should you take and which creative should you show the visitor? So this, the multi arm bandit solution is quite straightforward. Um, uh, so imagine that we have n different creatives. Um, so we do a continuous loop. Um, anytime a new consumer comes uh, to our web page, then we draw, then we basically run this code. First of all, we use the prior information. We have to estimate our PDFs for each of our N creatives. Um, we then sample from each of the PDFs. We choose the, uh, the, the, the uh, creative, which gave us the largest random value when we sample. We show that creative to the user. And then we, then we, then we, then we determine, was this a successful, um, uh, event or not? Did the user actually go to the next page or did they not? And we use this information to update our, um, our it, to update our, 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 
to, we, use, we use this information to update our knowledge. So we use this Bayesian information, um, this update about this creative. And we keep doing this, um, and that will um, end up determining what is the best creative to show to a website user, um, given you have a set of end creatives. Um, and we should use this algorithm when, e when each showing of I, when each of the creative costs either money or time or resources, and we really want to reduce costs um, as much as possible. So uh, let's go to part one of the notebook. Um, so you should already have downloaded this demo. Um, I want you to enter the notebook directory and start the notebooks um, at the Jupyter Notebook. So we can sort of do this together. Yeah. Um, am I running the notebook? Not yet. Okay, it's on the notebook. So I'm in the notebook directory. And I'm running um, Bayesian Bandit demo forward slash notebook. And I'm running the Jupyter Notebook. And that you will see a, OK, um, a Bayesian Bandit's walkthrough uh, connect to the kernel. Good. Come on. Reload. Uh, so, are so are, are there questions for me? Okay, good. Um, Any questions? Um, anyone? Before we go on. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's slightly faint, uh, but. I can't hear the question. No, no I mean, it, it, it's still faint. Emmanuel? Yes, I'm trying to increase the volume. Maybe. Yeah, I think now is OK. Now we can hear you. Go on. Okay, now I can. OK. And you talked about the beta function. I still I don't understand beta function, what it does exactly. I don't know if you can OK. So, um, what I will do is I will show us um, a beta function is a family of functions which um, can be used to describe probability distribution functions. And uh, in the notebook, I actually will actually use the beta function. And so uh, hopefully um, we can answer your question as we go just in the next in the next steps. Um, so we're going to run the notebook. Um, so. We're going to um, uh, import matplotlib, uh, scipy.stats, the beta function, and the binomial function. And of course, we'll also have NumPy running. OK, uh, so um, now we'll actually see an example of the beta function um, for a particular creative. So imagine that we have no information about a creative. We don't know if this is a, we don't know what the click through rate of this creative is because we've never shown this creative to a user. So the number of trials is zero and therefore the number of successes is also zero. Now we can describe this lack of knowledge about the click through rate as um, uh, a probability distribution function uh, described by a beta function. Um, and the parameters of the in function are one plus the number of successes and one plus the number ben, of trials. Ben, can you extend just the, the window just to be, ah, yeah, make it sorry. slightly bigger? Great. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, so it's one plus the uh, number of successes and one plus the number of trials minus the number of successes. These are the, the parameters we have to give to the beta function. And if we do that, so we call the beta function and we ask for um, the internal package from SciPy allows us to, to display the PDF. And what we see is uh, the PDF for the click-through rate for this creative that we know no, no information about. 
So our prior information is simply flat. It's between zero and one. The click-through rate might be perfect. It might be terrible. It might be somewhere in between. We don't know. And this is nicely encompassed in, in, this, in this prior. OK, so now let's say that we've actually shown. So now we ask our friend John, who also has got a web page very similar to ours, and has actually shown some creative to, a, um, to some users. And he actually finds that if he shows 10 users some creative, or when he showed 10 users some creative, he got five of the users to actually successfully click through to go to the next step in the um, in the process. So we can actually use this prior information from John in our analysis. Uh -huh. And so what I want us to do here is to code up what the prior information from John can look like. Um, can anyone help me? Can anyone type into the into our chat window uh, what? should go here for the prior information coming from John. We can use this prior information from not having any idea uh, of any trials or successes as a guide to what the prior information should be. I'll give people um, half a minute to type into the chat window and there are no wrong answers. Ah, great, very good. Who wrote that? Ken, very good, Ken. Uh, you're exactly right. So. Um, let me make it a bit more clear and say number of successes from John, a number of trials from John. One plus five, one plus five minus ten. Perfect. Let's evaluate this. So now what we have is two prior bits of information. The first is this flat one we had before where we didn't know anything about the creative. We'd never shown that to anybody. And the next prior bit of information is coming from our friend John, who's shown um, ten, uh, the creative 10 times, and he's had five successes. So we know that the creative isn't terrible, which means the probability of having a click-through rate isn't zero, because otherwise we would, have, we would have had zero successes instead of five. We also know the click-through rate isn't perfect. It's not one, because we don't have 10 successes, given we had 10 trials. And as we expect, the you know we, we ex the probability um, our probability distribution function for the click through rate is peaked around 0.5, and um, probably about 50% of people um, but you would click through. But you see, there's a big error here, and this error is a really clean way of describing our uncertainty about the probability, because we've only done this experiment once with ten well you know ten times. We don't know exactly what the probability is, so we really want to estimate these probability distribution functions. That's far more useful than estimating a point value, which would just be, you know, a um, number of trial, number of successes divided by number of trials, 0.5, and that that doesn't actually incorporate the our uncertainty of this problem. Okay, so now we're going to use this prior information from John, and we're going to run the campaign ourselves, and let's say we ran it ourselves. And we find that we we showed the, the um, that you showed 200 people the creative and 83 people click through. So now what I want us to do is um, uh, encode our new information. So that's uh, using the binomial distribution um, in. Uh, encode our new information here and to combine that with our um, our prior information that we had a moment ago from John um, and then plot this. Um, this is a bit trickier, uh, but does anyone want to have a guess about what we should be writing here? I've given a hint that it should be binome.p um, PMF. Um, you should really look at the scipy.stats.binomial link, um, but I'll give people um, half a minute to um, uh, to think about this and to uh, put an answer. Mm. 
this is this is definitely non-trivial. If if someone's asking a question, I can't hear. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's 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 good. Um, uh, Stephanie. Let me. Um, here your X here should be. Um, so the actually the if you look at the documentation of the binom dot pmf, you actually need to change the order of what you have here. So your X. Uh, no, no, you're right. X P N and P. Um, my X is a variable that goes between zero and one. And that's what we have is our click-through rate access probability. And so I actually need to bring that as the final variable in our binomial PDF um, 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 PMF um, distribution. We use the number of successes that you have, the number of trials you have. And this allows us to generate this new information. So let's plot this. So. We have some new information, which is drawn from the binomial distribution. And remember I said that we can multiply our binomial distribution with our beta function. And this is the beta function now comes from our prior knowledge that John had of the, of the event. We simply multiply this, this complex mess with the prior. And this is what we find out. So this is the posterior of our click-through rate. And what you see is that we've actually shifted a bit away from this 0 0.5 being the maximum. We've shifted a bit lower. Um, we still have some width to the distribution, um, but uh, but we've basically updated our knowledge based on this the, the, the successful campaigns that we did. Now, what I want to do now is to prove that we can actually, rather than calculating this this complex mess and then multiplying it together, we can get exactly to this final solution just by adding the number of successes and the number of the number of successes that we had and from our um, from our prior from John and the number of trials we had and that from our prior from John. So again, um, and I don't want to show that these two are equivalent. Um, so maybe someone can complete this uh, uh, this this line for me. It's very similar to the previous lines we had with the beta function. What does narrow plots imply? The narrow in plots means that we have more knowledge about the about the probability. Um, so it means that we we know that the click through rate wasn't exactly 0.5, um, but it's probably about 0.4. And we we've 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 learned more information about the about the probability distribution function, and therefore that means we've got a narrower um, probability distribution function. It means we're, we're more, we, our, our knowledge is more constraining. We, we, um, yeah. Okay, so the answer to this is, uh, yes, it means a lesser deviation, exactly. And uh, Stephanie, again, you're right. Um, the total number of successes, um, the total number of tr um, and one plus the total number of trials minus the total number of successes, and what I'm going to do is just plot this distribution with our newer distribution, which is the new that our new posterior distribution from our new information and our old information, and what we see, bang, I've plotted them on top of each other and they're identical. And what this really shows us is that rather than having to calculate complex binomial distributions and multiply things together, all we have to do is to update our knowledge of the of this of the click through rate for this particular creative is to keep adding the number of the results of subsequent uh, trials so um this is for one game for one creative but imagine we had another creative um where we we had 160 um we showed uh, and we showed this created to 160 people and 75 of them click through then we end up with two different distributions one for the creative one that we were calculating with our friend John and one that comes from this new creative um, and you see that the um, creative two 
has got a peak that's slightly higher along the x-axis, which is our click-through rate axis, a probability of click-through rate, than creative one. Um, and which means that probably if a new user were, were to come to our um, uh, onto our web page, it's probably better to show them creative two than creative one because that would lead to a slightly higher click-through rate. However, note we have uncertainty here. So the width of our PDFs is still quite large. So we, we're not exactly sure that creative one is better than creative two or creative two is better than creative one. Um, and we want some way to sample from this to figure out, uh, to, to basically learn which creative should we show the user and use this information to update our knowledge about the, the probability of the click-through rate for this. So um, let's, uh, so we've got two different creatives and they have two different probability of click-through rates. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that we've got five users coming to our web page and I, I'm going to determine which um, creative to show that user based on a random draw from these two PDFs. Now, um, we're going to use the numpy random.beta to uh, generate a random number from this PDF. Um, let me just uh, show you what this looks like. I can, I can run it. Um, uh, yeah, just do this. So you see, um, the random numpy dot random beta. Um, all ah, right. The, the, um, so yeah, I'll come back to that question. And um, the random numpy dot random dot beta takes exactly the same parameters as our beta function that we were just playing with. And so if we um, draw randomly from these two numbers, um, the first time we draw, um, we see that creative one has got a random draw of 0.4, creative two 0.5. Second time, 0.3, creative two, it's got a, a, a higher draw. And, but one time we drew randomly from these distributions, creative one gave us a higher score than creative two. Now, what I, now we actually will use this random draw as the, um, as the uh, deciding, as, as the logic to tell us what a creative we're gonna show to a user right now. So I've got an if statement here, and I'd like someone to um, provide some logic that would determine when we show creative one to the user and when we show should show creative two to the user based on this random these random draws. Okay, so if we look at this, the, the orange line, what we think, um, thanks Stephanie, that's right. What we think is if, um, so we don't know exactly what the best creative is. We, we have an idea of the probability distribution functions for the click-through rate of creative one in blue and creative two in yellow. But we don't have exact knowledge, which means um, if we just show them creative two, um, we might actually um, be losing money because creative one, if we had shown it to many more users, might actually have shifted in its location and be a better creative to show them um, than creative two. Um, and it's uh, really all about the um, uh, understanding our uncertainty of, the, of these click-through rates that we currently don't have. And so that's why it's sometimes better to also show um, cre some creative one. Um, right, so let's see what happens when we play this game. So that is exactly what um, Stephanie wrote. Um, um, so if creative one, so what we saw, we, we drew randomly from these beta functions. We got the values for the beta functions uh, from from the for the x-axis value. So the probability that this is a, a of, of our estimate of the probability, the point estimate of the probability for the click-through rate for creative one compared to creative two, 
And this means that because two was higher than one, we showed creative two to the user. And as, as um, who, who was this? It was maybe, um, ah, um, uh, Ilkura, um, Ilkera, uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, uh, you see that you were right thinking we should choose creative two most of the time, but sometimes we will choose creative one. Uh, you see here, randomly, we've just chosen to show creative one. Now, remember the Bayesian Banda algorithm. What we want to do is up, so use our prior information to estimate these probability distribution functions. We want to draw a random sample from each of the PDFs. We want to choose i, the, the choose the creative with the largest value. We show i to the user, and then we count, we determine if this is a success, was it success or not? Did the user have a click through? And then we update our knowledge in this Bayesian way based on this success or failure. And that gives us a better idea about what the, the click through rate is. So we're at um, 12.50, okay. Um, um, Yabi, so I guess we won't finish by um, uh, 1 p.m. Um, you said that there was an option for another slot maybe later on in the day, is that is that right? Unmuted, sorry. Uh, yes, I think there's there's definitely a chance to to do it at five o'clock or somewhere around that time. Um, what about uh, four four o'clock? Um, okay, let me check my calendar and get back to you. Four um, o'clock. Um, uh, I mean, maybe we could also three. do another lunchtime session. Oh, exactly. Uh, so you choose maybe maybe even like tomorrow to today, today at four Thursday, or around that. Okay. Um, I'll keep going. So. Um, I now like us to implement this Bayesian Banda algorithm, uh, and we're going to put it into a class. Um, and we'll, the class we will have, um, we will initialize the class with some initial beta matrix values. So this is simply the number of trials mm -hmm. and the number of successes. Then and we have that for a set of items. So an item can be creative number one mm -hmm. or creative number two, um, uh, and so on. Um, we have a function to add an item to our, our beta, our, our Bayesian bandit, um, and a function to update um, our algorithm based on the fact that we have a new information about a trial and a new information about success. Um, is anybody able to complete this line up here, which basically would update our beta matrix parameters which are the like the knowledge of our of our system? Uh, I'll give people just a few seconds. Uh, it's probably not so clear the way I've coded it, um, but what we have is the beta matrix consists of values of um, successes and values of um, uh, trials. And so actually what we want for this here is uh, this to be the number of successes uh, and we're going to add to this the number of trials. Um, I know it's difficult reading other people's code and so um, um, uh, I, I will I'll, I'll fix this now um, and then we can um, just, just move on. Um, but basically, we have a, a function to update our Bayesian bandit um, based on new knowledge of successes and trials. Um, and we also wrote a function to me? randomly draw from the um, Bayesian bandit to, and to give us the, um, uh, yeah, to, to give us a random number from the PDFs, a lot like we had, we were drawing random numbers from the PDFs here. Ben, do you okay, hear me? Um, is, so let's create the uh, Bayesian bandit. Where is it? I thought it was, but then. And I was, I we're going to yeah. initialize our Bayesian bandit with a set with a couple of creatives, creative number one and creative number two. And let's pretend actually I want this to be zero. Let's say we know nothing about these, these two creatives yet. We don't know which is the best and which is the not. 
Um, Hi Ben, do you hear me? We um, we want to update our Bayesian bandit. Is anyone able to complete this code, which would allow us to update the Bayesian bandit for uh, for Sir, this your creative? Screen your screen froze. Uh, I I can't hear you, Yabi. Oh, I think can you hear me now? Hello. Okay. I think there is a Google issue. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, indeed, you can calculate the um, uh, something equivalent to a p-value, if you will, um, for these uh, for these these PDFs. Um, but actually, using the full p uh, the full PDF is and, and the, the type of statistics you do on the PDFs is more rigorous than p-values. Um, this is something very good that, that yeah, um, as, as Yabi um, I mentioned, is uh, definitely worth googling. Um, so we've initialized the Bayesian bandit. We're going to update it with an item, which is actually then just this uh, uh, the creative the name of the creative. Um, and the number of successes and the number of trials from our information. Um, now, we basically have no information about this creative one or creative two. So if we draw randomly from this creative, then we should expect to mm -hmm. randomly yeah. see creative one sometimes mm -hmm. and randomly see creative two sometimes. Um, yeah, let's, um, okay, we can stop here. Um, Okay, let me uh, okay, see where do I want to go. Okay, so we're almost at the end of this um, um, implementing this Bayesian bandit. Uh, my, my screen froze. Okay, um, stop presenting. Yeah, yeah okay. Do you, do you um, hear me? So my, um, uh, do you now see my screen? Yeah. Uh -huh, I'm just presenting it, uh, great. So um, we're actually almost at the end of this section of the Bayesian, of part one and uh, of the Bayesian bandits in part two, in fact. So what I'd like you to do is try and complete this yourselves. Um, uh, complete uh, down to uh, uh, basically complete to here um, and we can come back and uh, and discuss this uh, at the next session and and in the next session we will also talk about um, how to take this Bayesian bandit and actually put it into a um, into a library file which I've done for us Build a Flask server, which is a way of an, a way of hosting web pages and APIs that allows us to talk to our service, and we build everything together into a Docker container. And I'll describe what this is. Um, and once we've done that, then we'll actually interact with our API with our Bayesian bandit um, um, uh, again through the Jupyter notebook. So um, I will I'll stop here, and uh, I'm open to any questions. And then, then I will align with Yabi when's a good time for us to meet again. Great. Thank you so much. I know that you can't hear me. I can hear you now, Yabi. OK, fantastic. Yeah, uh, wonderful. No, really, thank you so much, Ben. This was really enlightening. And I, um, if there is any question, um, anyone, just, yeah. And they are asking if you could commit some of the things that you have done. Um, just to the git, but yeah. Any so, other question? Um, we have another two, three minutes. So if you have a question. Hello. Yeah. Go on in the Yeah, please. Um, I didn't quite get why we did that creative hard. Though some people are saying you have to move to one, but I didn't quite get why we have to pick creative two uh, when creative one was quite higher. I want to get a bit of understanding about that. Okay, um, so uh, let's say, um, so 
this probability distribution function um, tells us our, our uncertainty of the click-through rate for the different creatives one and creative two. Is, is, is that clear? Yes, it's clear, but why we pick creative two? That is my question. Right. Um, so what you see is that these um, distributions are not um, uh, are not very well um, localized on the x-axis. They're quite broad. And what this means is that we have still quite a bit of uncertainty about what the actual click-through rate is for this game now um, and for this creative. Now, imagine that we showed this creative a hundred thousand times, right? We actually show the creative a gazillion times. Now you see that the um, uh, the y-axis value is uh, the x-axis value is very localized, which means we have an awful lot of information about this this creative too. And we see that um, because we've shown it sixteen thousand times, and we only had seven hundred and fifty. Um, uh, uh, click-throughs, for example. So if we were in this situation at the beginning, we already had a lot of information about these different creatives, then we could definitively say creative, and now it would be creative two a one is a lot better than creative two, definitely. However, if we're at the stage where we don't have much information, so we've only shown creative two 160 times, and we only had 72 successes, click-throughs from this creative, our knowledge of this of, of the probabilities is still not very good, which means we could easily make a big mistake if we only were to give creative two to a user from now onwards, because it might be that creative one actually has a better um, click-through rate, but because this is like a random process, but we've um, showing a... Um, a creative to a user and seeing if they click through or not, you can sort of draw this from a random process, like this exactly this Bernoulli distribution, which means that drawing from this distribution is inherently noisy. So we don't, just by drawing from it a few times, we don't have excellent information about the, about the localization of the, of the PDFs. Does that help? Yeah. So that means basically what we are using to judge. I, I can't hear anybody. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Uh, can people still see my screen? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Uh. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Like. Okay. Yeah. Can the tutor hear me? Uh, I, I think yes. Go on. Okay, so basically, um, so what we are using to judge the best um, creative ads is basically um, the distance between the probabilities, right? Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, can you can you type your question in the chat inbox, like, so that we can see if we can get it. Um, so that would be looking at the distances between the PDFs would be one way of um, determining what is the best creative. But what's actually the better way of doing this, and this is the Bayesian Bandit algorithm, is to draw a random number from the PDF. And that random number will lie between zero and one. And we do that for each of our PDFs. Then actually take the, the, take the show the creative with the largest randomly drawn number. And then that allows us to explore our creatives and, and, and make sure that we are um, statistically showing the best creative. Um, if you work through the notebook, what you'll actually see is that we very quickly go to the very best creative um, using this algorithm. So we, we don't waste much money on or, or resources on, on bad creatives. Um, finally, uh, in the um, Bayesian Bandit demo uh, notebook, uh, does everyone see my screen? 
Yeah, great. Um, there's a hidden directory, and the hidden directory has got the basically the solutions to the Bayesian bandit walkthrough demo that, that we have. So all the code that we've put in there and all the all the, all the solutions are actually here. I would prefer you to try and solve the problems yourself before looking at the answers, because then you, you would really understand what's going on more. Um, but of course, if you get very stuck, then do look at the answers. Um, I will then organize a time with um, Yabi when we can continue this meeting. Um, so let me end there, say thanks a lot for everyone's attention. Um, we, um, so uh, I, I do have a final slide, let me just show that one, because um, in summary, um, I've shown that Bayesian bandits can be used to tackle a range of interesting problems. Um, we are still in the process of um, uh, implementing this, um, but do note that there are um, internship opportunities at Carl Zeiss, and also within um, Adludio, which is a, um, a company that um, Yabi's working with. Um, and so if you're, you'd be interested in doing an internship with us, um, do, do, let, do let me know. Um, and uh, so then I'll stop there and we'll organize another time to go through the second part of the, the meeting. Um, il ken, um, yeah, um, le, ke, le keru, le kerua. Il Kerua, yeah. yeah, good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Good afternoon. Yeah, I can hear you. Good afternoon. Okay. Yeah, my question is basically about the spread. Uh, because if you look at Creative Ad 1, I think Creative Ad 1 is quite, if you look at the width, the width is um, larger than that of Creative Ad 2. So does it mean we are judging, are we basing our judgment on how close the widths are to the 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 probabilities? Because if you look at Creative Arts 1, I think the width starts from 0 0.3, why Creative yeah. Arts 2 yeah. starts from 0 0.4 and ends at 0 0.6, yeah. whereas yeah. Um, Creative Arts 1 starts from 0. I think 0 0.35 to 0 0.5 something. Is, yeah. that, is that what you're using to judge um, although we are not using, although you know we are not judging with this one, but is that what we are using? We are going to use to judge if we are going to make a false assumption, like if creative R two is better, are we using the width between the zero point um, three to zero point six? Yeah, is that how we judge the best ads. So yes, you are using the width. Um, however, I mean, it's, maybe it's not so clear that you're yeah. using the width, but because we're putting these numbers into um, uh, into our numpy.random.beta function then and we're, we're asking for a random number to be drawn from this distribution function with the parameters that go into our distributions then we are inherently using the width of the distributions um when we uh, when, when we make this random call these two random calls okay thank you very much you're welcome thank you very much yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone for your attention. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I will also be available on Slack. Um, and um, uh, yep. Yeah. And have a nice day.